So we're going to look at record keeping. What do we need? What do we want? And how will we use the records? So Stacy did a really good job of what records do you need to keep? So I'm going to put this into different categories. There's some records that because of regulations, you have to keep these records. And those are the purchases. Who'd you purchase animals from? When did you do it? What type of animals were they? Um, how old were they? And what it was their scrapie ID number. If you're buying breeding females and breeding rams or uh, breeding males, they must have a scrapie tag. Don't buy them and bring them on your farm without a scrapie tag in their ear. Um, the person selling them to you is really breaking the law by not putting a tag in before they left their farm. So what do you need to keep? The records of who you purchase. And you need to keep records of who you sold animals to. Um, and that's, that's all these animals that you sell from little ewe lamb bottle lambs that you sold to somebody all the way up to the breeding stock you sell. Um, none of this rec none of these scrapey regulations really seem real until you have a federal veterinarian drive into your yard with a quarantine paper in their hand and tell you that you are now under quarantine because you have a trace back animal on your farm. And then all this becomes really real and you might think you had really good records and when it comes down to it and you need records going back five years from every animal you've bought and sold um, it starts to be a real challenge for what animals went to which markets and uh, where they're and and where they ended up and where did you buy them from so those are the records you need to keep Aside from the ones you need to keep, the next set of records are ones that are significant to profit. And over and over and over again in the circles that I run in, there's only about three things that make a, a significant difference to profit on farms, on, the, on sheep farms, and I don't think goat farms will be any different. Um, the number one is how many lambs did you have born and how many of the ones that were born did you market? So the lambs marketed is a huge driver to profit on a business. And of course you can't market a lamb if it wasn't born. So that number of lambs born or number of kids born becomes very important. Uh, the next is the weights of lambs. So it's how many pounds of lamb and how many pounds of goat did you sell per market you or per market doe? And that's the other driver because in the, in the end, in all of this, we sell weight. And we sell weight at different prices, but we sell weight. So that the, the pounds leaving the farm is important. Um, the age of these animals when they leave the farm because the the first or second highest cost of doing business as a sheep and goat farm is feed. The faster you can get things to market, generally the lower your feed cost is. So this, the weight that they go to market is important and the age that they go to market is important. The faster they leave the farm, the faster you get paid and the less feed that you generally have into those animals. And then we have culling lists and the reason why you cull. Um, it's not really just enough to say, well, I, I sold five sheep. You really want to look at the reasons you're selling them. Is it because they're having mastitis or are they old? Or are they having foot problems? What's the reason they're leaving the farm? And is there a management issue that you need to take care of? to make sure that the animal, that the breeding stock can stay on the farm for a longer period of time, more years. And the last item I've got on this list is death losses. Like I said before, it's, it's numbers of lambs or kids that are marketed. And you have to kind of get a grip of why are you losing lambs? And I look at it as the low hanging fruit. If I have 
a list of all the lambs we lost on our operation in a year and why they all died. And that's sometimes a judgment call, but it, and it requires a little bit of work. You have to investigate. Um, and sometimes you gotta cut lambs open and find out, is it pneumonia? Is it a navel infection? Is it something else? Is it injuries? And do a little bit of your own research as to why these animals died. But pick the low-hanging fruit. If a third of all the death losses are starvation, then that shouldn't be. You should be able to go in and intervene earlier and stop the, stop the starvation losses. If it's pneumonia, then let's look at what can we do to reduce pneumonia. Is it the amount of bedding we use or lack of? Is it not cleaning out the barns? Is it poor ventilation? But those reasons that we lose lambs is significant to the number of lambs that we market and, and the number of does and kids that we market. So we're gonna keep our death loss reasons. These are the top things for significance to profit. Additional records that should be kept. And now this is a should. This is the, this is the category of, um, what most people are not keeping track of, but has significant legal ramifications to your business. The number one is treatments with drugs. And I like to carry that treatment date right on the back of the sheep. So if we give an antibiotic shot to an animal, um, we will mark, we'll mark the animal that we gave the shot and I'll put a date on that animal, just write it right on with paint that it got a shot on March 3rd. And it may not say what it was treated with on March 3rd, that's gotta be in my paper records, but it, it all comes back to withdrawal times. And in our record system, it's all computerized. When we give a antibiotic shot or a wormer, the withdrawal times are all built into the software. If I try to move an animal to market before it's out of drug withdrawal, it'll flag up on my handheld computer that she's in withdrawal, are you sure you wanna move her to market? And this isn't just a, you know, you should do it because it's a good thing to do. The federal statutes tell us that we are supposed to keep track of our drug uses, but most people do not. It's um, and I'd say most people don't until there again, you have the FDA or the USDA knocking at your door telling you that you had an animal go through the slaughter channels with drug residues. And by the way, they will want to see your records of your drug use. And you need to try and verify that you, uh, how you use the drugs that you purchased. And where, where are your records for those drugs? The other records that should be kept are the manual treatments we do. The things that cost us time and energy. Um, first one for me would be hoof trimming. If I've got to trim every sheep on the farm hooves, I don't, well, I don't think I'd do it anymore, but I would find a management way to get around that. And, uh, and maybe hoof trimming is not as important as we maybe think it is. If you are trimming hooves because you have foot rot and foot scald, then you have bigger issues and need to use those records to, to really seriously ask yourself if you're eradicating that problem from your farm. Inverted eyes, I see these as an annoyance, but probably something that you should keep records of to find out is it is are these inverted eyes coming through bloodlines genetic or is it simply ewes that are having uh, large lambs more maybe a difficult birth and those muscles in the eyes are getting stretched but um, if you can keep the records on them that I think that would be valuable and vaginal prolapses this is a the records for that is you put a big X on the back of that U and as soon as she's done weaning her lamb, she goes to market. 
because if she did it this year, she'll do it next year, and likely her daughters will also do it. So vaginal prolapses is guaranteed on the call list with comments on them. Additional records that you may want to keep. And I say may because this, this is just a little tiny list. And with my contacts across the US, I have people keeping all kinds of records on animals. Um, you may want to keep them. Mothering ability, lambing knees, milk scores, uh, shedding score for the hair breeds. They, they do watch that. They want a hair sheep that'll shed out that wool early in the year. And then disposition, um, which hopefully is only going to be a very, very small percentage of sheep. But you have chronic ones that are always jumping out of their pens or crawling fences. They need, they need a record placed on them to uh, have, that, have that animal leave the farm. Stages of record keeping. So I kind of broke this out into, into different flock or herd sizes. I think up to about 50 head, you can get by with a simple recipe card or a notebook type system where each you or doe has one page in the notebook or a one, not a small recipe card, but like a five by eight recipe card where it has all of her records on it. It has her date of birth, who her dam was, her sire was, and then the list of all of the lambs that she's ever had born would be on that one card. And I think this works up to about 50 head of breeding, breeding animals. Beyond that, it's, it's too many pages and it's too hard to find and sort information out. Uh, the back side of this card will have her purchase and sale information, as well as any comments or treatments that you might want to write on them. So I, I look at this as the, the kind of the first step, just a really simple recipe, just a real simple um, record keeping system that, you know, you can carry a notebook around to the pens and just flip to the page that has that you or the doe on it and fill in her current information. The next stage, 50 to about 100 ewes and 100 does would be a barn card style record where you are making a list of all of the animals born and it's multiple dams and lambs on each sheet of paper. So maybe if you've got 100 ewes, you might have, at the end of the year, you might have 10 pages that you've got all of their lambing for the year on with, you know, the ewes ID number, the date the lambs were born, maybe a paint number, birth type, the lambs tag numbers, sex, birth weights, and then further over on the page is the weaning date and the weaning weight. So you can start to get an idea of um, who's, who's bringing in the largest lambs. And with these barn cards, you're going to have to transfer them to some type of a spreadsheet. Either retype them into a spreadsheet or directly enter them into a sheet. However you want to work. When I was tablets, it may be just as easy to have a spreadsheet right on a tablet or on your phone and enter it all at that point, right at kind of real time. But the spreadsheets allow you then to go through and do some sorting, pull out all of the ewes that had twin births during that year, uh, pull out all the ewe lambs that were twin or triplet born, those, those types of things. And then the next stage, 100 plus breeding animals. Um, at this point, I think you're ready for a dedicated computer software, one that's written for sheep or written for goats. Uh, there's lots of companies to choose from. I'm not going to begin to state them. I work for one company that's got a, a software program for this. Um, it can be phone-based or PC-based. If it's phone based, you're likely going to have to also have something on your PC to be able to print some decent reports. Um, 
whatever dedicated software you get, I'm a firm believer that it has to keep lifetime records for animals. So if you're, it's got to be built to hold a lot of animal records. And, uh, you know, if you think of a uh, hundred breeding animals, if you average twins, you've got 200 animals a year. In five years, you've got a thousand records, 10 years, you've got 2000 records built up and that's only a flock of a hundred breeding animals. Um, the numbers of records pile up really fast, but so does the usable data if you can do lifetime records. It must keep statutory records. It has to keep those records that Stacy's talking about. So you, so it all resides in one place. Who would you buy the animals from and where were they sold to? It needs to all be in that, in that record keeping system. The key to all of these dedicated software programs is reporting capabilities. They've got to be able to generate reports that are meaningful to you. And that's a, with, with what I do now working for Shearwell, there's a lot of different things that people look for. Um, not every farmer ranch is the same in what their ultimate goal is for their operation and what items are important to them. Some it is lambing percentage and it's weight driven. Some it's fleece driven. Um, higher quality fleeces and more money in that. But the reporting capabilities are key. And it, it has to be something that has gone beyond a simple spreadsheet. Um, it's it's got to have abilities to do some pretty serious queries as you go through data. And I think if you go to a dedicated computer software and you're in this 100 plus breeding animals, you may not use EID right away, but I think you should buy software that's EID compatible um, so that in a couple years or less than a couple years, if you feel like it, you can switch to electronic tags and keep right on moving with your software. So the next stage is this 200 plus breeding animals. Um, I think at this point, it's time to seriously consider RFID technology and dedicated software. And I, and I really think that point is coming closer to the 100 breeding animals instead of 200. But at 200 plus, I think you've got to look at RFID technology and dedicated software. Uh, the reports become even more important just because you're dealing with many thousands of animal records. And if you try to do that in spreadsheet format, it's too cumbersome. You just can't, you can't wade through all of the data. <coughs> um, and at 200 plus animals, the data gathering has to be fast and accurate. Um, I had a friend of mine that's in the swine business and they figured on handwritten records by the time they were done writing the records and transferring them through computer systems, their error rate was about 30%, which means 30% of all their data was kind of garbage. Uh, the video that's running right now, that's an EID shoot. It's a way scale. Those lambs are walking in. It's reading their ear tag number as they step in the back gate. Uh, it's automatically opening the back gates and the front gates. It's reading their tag, recording their tag number, recording their weight. And then it's looking at the list to see if they're on my keeper ewe lamb list, so replacement female list. And if they are, it's sending them into the left-hand pen. If they're not, it's sending them out the forward pen. And so with this technology, I'm recording a lot of data at this point. It's also putting them in a list for me of everybody that came out that left-hand gate at the end of the day is on a, on a list of animals. But I can do this. We can run about five to 600 head an hour through here. And uh, with one to two people, uh, two is better, but one doesn't work too bad if they've been up the chute a few times. So. So then we look at ear tags, the identification part of it. 
Um, you basically get a choice of you're going to either use two piece ear tags, so a male and a female tag with two parts. And I've just show a few different styles, a flag tag with a button back, um, a double a double little flag style tag with a pin. Uh, the orange one is a handwritten tag. Purple one is obviously a, a laser etched or printed. I guess as it's stamped and then printed, which is different than laser printed. The little Premier tag, 7315, that is a laser etched tag. And it's the smallest, smallest little scrapey tag that you can get through Premier. Uh, all good tags. They're, the red one's probably too big for sheep. That's That would be my caution with that. Is that. The bigger and heavier the tag, the poorer the retention rate in general. Um, the smaller the tag, the better the retention, but they're harder to read. So there's trade-offs on all of this. And then you can go to one-piece tags. So this is a one-piece tag that just folds over the edge of the ear. So one end of it is a pin and one end of it has a hole. The white one in the middle is an electronic scrapey tag. So what Stacy talked about, it's an 840 tag, but there's a chip underneath, inside the plastic where it says unlawful to remove, there's a microchip inside of there or a transponder inside of there that works with our RFID readers. Again, these, tags that you see there are all laser etched and so that printing does not come off. Uh, the tag may fade, the writing may fade, but that laser etching is going to be going to be there for a while. And then there's other styles that Stacy also talked about. There's tattoos, implants, collars for goats, um, what you see in the photograph is a picture of a tattoo on our place. We tattoo all of our ewe lambs at about eight months of age. And this one's pretty dirty. We were just actually cleaned it off so we could read it as it was going to the dead pile. But um, they're pretty legible. This tattoo is a, it's a cattle sized tattoo put in at about eight months old and green ink. They show up really well. You do have to, it takes a little bit of finesse to do a good job of tattooing, but you have to clean the ears. You got to put the ink on, rub the ink into the tattoo. And so it's a process, but I can tattoo animals about as fast as we can tag animals. So that's not an issue. And tattoos for sure are permanent. Um, that unless that ear freezes or falls off, the tattoo will always be there. With tags, you can expect tag loss. It's just the nature of the beast. There will be tag loss. And I would recommend on on all of these tags, on all these tags for breeding animals, I would recommend double tagging, tagging each year. And they don't need to match. They just need to be recorded that so you have a cross-reference of what tags they're carrying. Numbering schemes. Oh, I've seen almost everything in numbering schemes, I think. Um, my, my point of education for people is avoid ever duplicating tag numbers. Now that means you are not just gonna go to Fleet Farm or the farm store every year and buy Tags number one through 25 or one through 50. Spend a little bit more money, go to a tag manufacturer and order your tags with numbers on them that you decide what's on the tag instead of the off the shelf tag. And I would, you know, you can color code your tags by year, but let's think long term here a little bit and there's only so many colors in our rainbow of tag of, tags available and it doesn't take too long and you run out of colors and you start repeating white or yellow and now you've got ewes in the flock that are 
eight years old with yellow tags and you've got new animals that have yellow tags and if you bought them at the farm store they all have a number one on them or a number five and it's just a recipe for long-term disaster on records so that would be my short sermon um, <clears throat> i prefer a tag number that has the first two digits to be the year of birth which all of these tags in the picture there All the tags in the picture violate that that plan. Um, it's fine to have the 7000 series, you know, born in 2017. But if you're in this for the long term, in 10 years, you're going to run into the 7000 series again. So I think it's just better off use a two. Keep touching my keypad here. Just better off to use it two years for the, the year as a two digits, first two digits on the tag. You can use color for something else like sire lines. Um, some people put a different color in if they're a male and a female. Um, some will put the male tags in the left ear and the female tags in the right ear so they know male from female as they come down the chute. Um, Two tags are one, I already talked about that. I think as you have adult animals, I think it's imperative that you have two tags. Partially for this scrapey trace back, I shouldn't even say scrapey, should be disease trace back, where if they lose their scrapey tag, you can still tie that animal back to their original tag number. Um, letters as part of tag numbers. I've seen too many times when people have records and they'll start off with write down U number B24 for blue 24. And then the next year, the blue tag number 24 walks in the pen and somebody else writes down the tag number and they write it down as 24B. And as far as computers are concerned, that's two totally different animals even though it was the same animal. So I, I, I really prefer to leave letters out of the tag numbers. I think it just makes records cleaner. Um, but again, it's all your choice. You can, it is a free country and we can do what we want, but I'm just warning you of some of the pitfalls. And then also as you get into sorting things in lists, if you have mixed items with letters and numbers, it makes your list sorting a little more complex. How many digits should you use on your tags? If you only have 90, up to 99 lambs or 99 kids born a year, you can get by with a four digit tag. The first two digits, the year of, year of birth, the last two digits, an animal number. And you'll never duplicate animal numbers if you do that. Up to a thousand animals, you better go at least a five digit tag. And if you're, up in the nine, well, if you're up less than 10,000, then you better have a six digit tag number. And if you're at that point, you're in EID anyways, um, or, or no tagging at all. It's, you kind of run both, both scenarios and when you get that large. What are we gonna use this, these records for? Um, Keep and call decisions. So you're going to keep these records, and at the end of your lambing season, you're going to go through and who brought in no lambs at all or no no kids at all at weaning? Those, those all go to the call list. I'm, I'm not very friendly to my sheep, so they they don't get many strikes and they're out. So we're gonna. We're going to use these records to really pull off about the bottom 10 to 15 percent of the flock every year. The ones that just can't produce lambs don't bring in enough weight, uh, don't have multiple lambs being marketed or, or even weaned. Uh, those all end up on that bottom 10 percent. Use that or those that have singles two years in a row, even if they keep them alive, those animals are gone because they they cannot compete with an animal that brings back twins. 
we'll use these records to select replacements. So you can go through your written or your computer records, pull up a list of all of your twin or triplet or quad born ULAMs and start sorting those off as replacement animals for your flock. Regulatory, we already hit on that. Um, breeding decisions, what ewes are gonna go to what rams? And in the, in the end, when you go through and you're gonna, and the lambs are being born, to be able to go through and know approximately what sire or sire line was the, was the sire of the lambs in question or the kids in question. And then selling what the market wants. Uh, there's a lot of different markets right now. I've worked with some producers in the east that they are they're going through their animals out on pasture about every two weeks, and they will pull off every lamb out of the pasture that's over 75 pounds. And those lambs will go directly to market. And then they're gonna keep track of those lambs and who's the who's going to market the fastest, which sire lines go to the market the fastest. And uh and they're also tracking their daily gains. So when they see when they see uh an ethnic holiday coming up, they can look at weight sheets and to start to determine how many lambs are we gonna have available for that next market that's coming. And the last one is Increasing productivity and profit. You've got to, it's not enough to just have a stack of barn cards or a stack of U cards. You need to really seriously use them to, to one, drop off that bottom 10 to 15% that just don't make any money, and then keep the very best replacement females back for yourself. Um, that's ultimately what's going to keep all of our doors open. And I'm going to stop with that, and we can go on for questions a little bit later. And uh, I'll turn it back over to, I think, Cindy Wolf is up next.